Ja, herzlich willkommen zu unserem letzten Panel dieses Tages. Ich muss sagen, ich bin wirklich begeistert. Ich hatte gedacht, dass ähm, viele von Ihnen um diese Zeit schon gegangen sein würden, aber Sie sind wirklich ein großartiges Publikum. Vielen Dank. Applaus an unsere Gäste. Ähm, Lassen Sie mich kurz selbst vorstellen, ich, ich bin Britta Petersen, die Leiterin der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung in Pakistan. Ähm, und ähm, unser letztes Panel äh, handelt von ähm, The Troubled Neighborhood, die schwierige Nachbarschaft, ähm, die regionale Perspektive auf Afghanistan. Und ich denke, das ist ähm, ein sehr wichtiges Panel, deswegen bin ich auch froh, dass noch so viele von Ihnen hier sind. Ähm, denn die Be Debatte in Deutschland hat meines Erachtens äh, die regionale Perspektive zu lange vernachlässigt. Ähm, wir haben uns sehr viel mit der Frage beschäftigt, ob und in welcher Form ein Land mit unserer Vergangenheit sich militärisch in Afghanistan engagieren sollte ähm, und dabei vergessen, dass in dem Augenblick, wo wir Truppen nach Afghanistan geschickt haben, wir Teil dieses sogenannten Great Games geworden sind und wir äh, als Akteur darin eine Verantwortung tragen. Ähm, Teil dieser Verantwortung ist es, die regionale Perspektive zu verstehen. Denn ähm, eins ist klar, die Zukunft Afghanistans liegt nicht in Berlin und äh, sie liegt äh, wahrscheinlich auch nicht in Washington. Ähm, selbst wenn die letzten Besatzungs- oder ähm, ausländischen Soldaten das Land verlassen haben, wird Pakistan noch immer der größte Nachbar Afghanistan sein. Ähm, Indien wird nach wie vor die größte Regionalmacht in Südasien bleiben. Wir hätten auch hier noch Vertreter aus dem Iran und aus den zentralasiatischen Republiken einladen können. Dazu fehlte uns leider die äh, Möglichkeit, ähm, sind zeitlich beschränkt. Äh, ich bin aber sehr froh, dass wir hier ähm, sehr kompetente Vertreter haben, äh, einiger der wichtigsten äh, Interessen in Afghanistan, in der Region. Und lassen Sie mich kurz vorstellen, ähm, Christian Wagner ist ähm, der Leiter der Forschungsgruppe Asien an der ähm, an der Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik und ähm, äh, dabei spezialisiert er sich vor allem auf Südasien. Er hat vor allem zu Indien, Pakistan, Bangladesch und Sri Lanka publiziert. Ähm, hier zu meiner unmittelbaren Rechten sitzt Ajas Haider. Ajas Haider ist äh, ein unabhängiger Sicherheitsanalyst, der sowohl im Journalismus als auch äh, im akademischen Bereich zu Hause ist. Er war lange äh, Redakteur der Daily Times. Äh, er trägt regelmäßig mit Kolumnen zu verschiedenen anderen pakistanischen Zeitungen bei. Äh, er hat an verschiedenen Universitäten gelehrt und war auch Fellow an einem US-Think Tank. Zu meiner Linken sitzt Commodore Uday Bashkar, der ähm, 37 Jahre in der, in der ähm, indischen Marine gedient hat, äh, bevor er äh, eine zweite Karriere als Analyst für Außen- und Sicherheitspolitik begann, äh, begonnen hat und ähm, dabei an verschiedenen äh, nationalen Thinktanks in Indien äh, tätig gewesen ist, äh, zuletzt äh, als Direktor des National Maritime Institute. Ähm, aber vor einiger Zeit, vor relativ kurzer Zeit, äh, hat er auch diesen Posten niedergelegt und ist jetzt unabhängiger denn je. Ähm, auf meiner Linken sitzt und ich freue mich sehr darüber, dass wir ähm, Darcy Burner hier haben, ähm, weil auch die US-Perspektive selbstverständlich ähm, äh, sehr wichtig ist äh, für Afghanistan und für die Region ähm, und ähm, wie mir scheint auch in den letzten Jahren zunehmend unklarer geworden ist. Ähm, Darcy Burner ist ähm, Präsidentin ähm, des, ähm, des Progressive Congress. Das ist eine Organisation, die progressiven Kongressabgeordneten in den USA zur Verfügung stellt für Analysen und äh, Forschung. Ähm, und sie ist außerdem Mitglied der Afghanistan Study Group gewesen. Und last but not least haben wir auch einen Vertreter aus Afghanistan da. Sanjay Sohal ist einer von den jüngeren Afghanen, die in den letzten zehn Jahren ihre Karriere im Journalismus gemacht haben. Er ist Herausgeber der Zeitung Hashtu Sob, einer der wichtigsten Printmedien in Afghanistan. Wir verfahren dann heute Abend so, dass ähm, wir Christian Wagner darum bitten, uns einen kurzen Aufriss zu geben über die Situation in der Region, was sind die äh, Interessen der einzelnen Spieler äh, und dann ähm, werden wir bitten, die anderen vier ähm, ähm, Podiumsteilnehmer ähm, darum bitten, ihre Sichtweise auf die Dinge zu geben. Dann werden wir vielleicht noch eine zweite Runde machen und danach äh, öffnen wir das Podium für Ihre Fragen und Kommentare. Christian. 
Ja, vielen Dank, Britta, für die freundliche Einführung. Ähm, auch von meiner Seite einen ähm, schönen guten Nachmittag, meine Damen und Herren. Ich freue mich, heute hier sein zu können und ähm, einen kurzen Input zu geben zur Frage der regionalen Dimension des Afghanistan-Konfliktes. Die Übergabe der Verantwortung, die Transition der internationalen Gemeinschaft an die afghanischen Sicherheitskräfte und der beginnende Truppenabzug diesen Sommer leiten ja eine neue Phase in der politischen Entwicklung Afghanistans ein. Die Diskussion über, diese regionale, über die regionalen Lösungsansätze, über die regionale Dimension des Konfliktes symbolisiert vielleicht aber auch so etwas wie eine zweite Transition, in der nämlich die Verantwortung für die Stabilisierung Afghanistans zunehmend auf die Nachbarstaaten verlagert wird. Die Konferenzen in Istanbul und Bonn im November und Dezember diesen Jahres bilden erste Wegmarken in diesem Prozess. Die Hoffnungen, die sich mit einer regionalen Strategie verbinden, sind allerdings aus meiner Perspektive doch eher überzogen. Regionale Zusammenarbeit ist leider nicht die Antwort auf die politischen und wirtschaftlichen Probleme Afghanistans, bietet aber doch in bestimmten begrenzten Bereichen sicherlich neue Möglichkeiten für vertrauensbildende Maßnahmen und neue Formen der Zusammenarbeit. Die prekäre Sicherheitslage in Afghanistan hat ja seit vielen Jahren negative Auswirkungen auf die Nachbarstaaten, sei es durch transnationalen Terrorismus, Flüchtlingsströme sowie Drogen, Waffen und Menschenhandel. Pakistanische Taliban-Gruppen haben sich von den afghanischen Taliban abgespalten und kämpfen seit vielen Jahren gegen den, Pakist gegen den pakistanischen Staat. Im Iran ist die hohe Zahl der Drogenabhängigen eines der größten sozialpolitischen Probleme, die Flüchtlingsströme in Pakistan oder die, Anha oder die immer noch vorhandenen Flüchtlinge in Pakistan und Afghanistan ähm, bilden natürlich auch dort noch ein innenpolitisches Problem. Es stellt sich also die Frage, warum es bislang eigentlich trotz dieser gemeinsamen Probleme so wenig Ansätze für eine regionale Zusammenarbeit gegeben hat in der Region. Und ich will im Folgenden zwei Antworten geben. Zum Ersten natürlich die unterschiedlichen außenpolitischen Interessen, die wir in der Region beobachten. Zum Zweiten aber auch die begrenzten wirtschaftlichen Möglichkeiten und auch die vielleicht besondere Struktur von Regionalorganisationen, die wir in diesen Regionen beobachten. Lassen Sie mich zum ersten Punkt kommen, divergierende außenpolitische Interessen. Der politische Optimismus über die Chancen der regionalen Kooperation, den man in der Presse lesen kann, spiegelt für mich vermutlich eher die Ratlosigkeit der internationalen Gemeinschaft wider, nämlich wie und in welcher Form man angesichts der sehr komplexen Konfliktkonstellation in Afghanistan eine tragfähige politische Lösung findet. Die Notwendigkeit der wirtschaftlichen Zusammenarbeit mit den Nachbarstaaten ist ja bereits sehr früh, schon ab 2003, betont worden, doch haben sich daraus natürlich keine nachhaltigen regionalen Institutionen entwickelt. Mit dem Abzug der ausländischen Truppen wächst nun erneut die Gefahr, dass Afghanistan wie in der ersten Hälfte der 90er Jahre erneut zu einem Schlachtfeld regionaler Rivalitäten wird, sei es zwischen Indien und Pakistan oder zwischen Pakistan und dem Iran. In der Gesamtschau aller Nachbarn, und das ist sicherlich die betrübliche Nachricht, und der involvierten Großmächte zeigt sich, dass die Interessenunterschiede der Nachbarstaaten in der Gesamtsumme größer sind als ihre Gemeinsamkeiten. Es bedeutet zugleich auch, dass der jeweils von Afghanistan ausgehende Problemdruck in, der Nach in den Nachbarstaaten in der Abwägung mit anderen nationalen strategischen Interessen nicht groß genug, vermutlich nicht groß genug ist, um einen Wandel hin zu einer stärkeren regionalen Kooperation einzuleiten. Afghanistan ist für seine beiden wichtigsten Nachbarn, Pakistan und Iran, vermutlich nur ein Nebenkriegsschauplatz in ihrer außenpolitischen Agenda. Für den Iran hat, ist dies neben dem Schutz der schiitischen Truppen in Afghanistan vor allem der Konflikt mit den USA und mit Pakistan. Für Pakistan steht wiederum in Afghanistan der Konflikt mit Indien, aber auch die Rivalität zum Iran im Vordergrund. Im Folgenden würde jetzt ein Abschnitt kommen, der sich mehr mit den indisch-pakistanischen Beziehungen beschäftigt. Da wir aber sowohl einen indischen als auch einen pakistanischen Vertreter hier haben, denke ich, ähm, lass, überlasse ich den beiden Kollegen an dieser Stelle ähm, den Raum für ihre Ausführungen und würde mich ähm, deshalb 
doch ähm, mehr schon mit der zweiten Frage beschäftigen, nämlich nach den Grenzen. Die, die erste waren ja die divergierenden außenpolitischen Interessen. Ich denke, meine indischen und pakistanischen Kollegen werden Ihnen das sehr ausführlich darstellen. Ich selber will vielleicht noch mal auf den zweiten Punkt stärker eingehen, nämlich die Frage nach den begrenzten wirtschaftlichen Möglichkeiten. Bestehende Regionalorganisationen, in denen Afghanistan Mitglied ist, haben sich bislang leider nicht durch besondere Erfolge ausgezeichnet. Neben den ja, offensichtlichen innenpolitischen Problemen ist es vor allem auch die ja, fehlende wirtschaftliche Komplementarität zwischen den Nachbarstaaten, die eben nur wenig Ansätze in der Region bietet für den Ausbau des regionalen Handels. Afghanistan wurde ja 1992 zusammen mit den zentralasiatischen Staaten Mitglied der Economic Cooperation Organization, die bereits 1985 gegründet worden war. Ziel der, äh, Ziel der Economic Cooperation Organization war es, die wirtschaftliche, technische und kulturelle Zusammenarbeit zwischen den Mitgliedstaaten voranzutreiben angesichts des Bürgerkriegs in Afghanistan und der bilateralen Konflikte zwischen den Mitgliedstaaten hat die Organisation aber bis heute natürlich keine nennenswerte Fortschritte erzielt. Die 1985 gegründete South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SAIC, wurde lange Zeit durch den indisch-pakistanischen Konflikt blockiert. Erst mit der Liberalisierung Indiens 1991 gab es eine Reihe von Initiativen, um den regionalen Handel innerhalb Südasiens auszuweiten. Indien war auch eine der treibenden Kräfte, um Afghanistan 2007 in die SAIC aufzunehmen. Trotzdem ist die wirtschaftliche Zusammenarbeit zwischen Afghanistan, Pakistan und Indien bislang kaum in Gang gekommen. Das 2010 überarbeitete Transitabkommen zwischen Pakistan und Afghanistan sollte eine, Überland, eine direkte Überlandverbindung zwischen Indien und Pakistan ermöglichen, die, wenn ich es aber richtig verstanden habe, bislang noch nicht umgesetzt wurde. Positiv in diesem Kontext zu nennen ist sicherlich aber die jüngste Annäherung, die wir zwischen Indien und Pakistan beobachten können. Diese wird vermutlich auch vom Ausbau der wirtschaftlichen Beziehungen be ähm, begleitet sein. Von pakistanischer Seite ähm, gibt es mittlerweile ähm, die Ankündigung, Indien den Most Favorite Nation Status an, ähm, zu, zu erkennen und man will im Handel auch von der traditionellen Positivliste äh, auf eine Negativliste übergehen, was den Handel zwischen Indien und Pakistan oder was dem Handel zwischen Indien und Pakistan einen deutlichen Aufschub ähm, ähm, ermöglichen würde. Wir haben also zwei Regionalorganisationen, die bislang eben ja sich auf wirtschaftliche Zusammenarbeit kon äh, konzentriert haben, die aber natürlich aufgrund der politischen Probleme als auch der Struktur der Volkswirtschaften ähm, bislang keine Erfolge erzielt haben. Es gibt eine weitere und vielleicht die einzig nennenswerte sicherheitspolitische Regionalorganisation, die sogenannte Shanghai Cooperation Organization, die SCO, in der Afghanistan aber kein Mitglied ist. Allerdings hat die, hat die SCO mittlerweile eine Kontaktgruppe mit Afghanistan etabliert und die Schwerpunkte liegen, wie sollte es anders sein, auf der Bekämpfung des Terrorismus, des Drogenhandels und des organisierten Verbrechens. Allerdings gibt es auf Seiten der SCO, zu der unter anderem Länder wie China und Russland und die zentralasiatischen Republiken gehören, natürlich bislang kein Interesse, sich aktiv in die Konfliktregulierung in Afghanistan einzumischen oder dort zu engagieren. Regionalorganisationen wie äh, die äh, ECO, also die Eco äh, Economic Cooperation Organization oder SAIC, sind natürlich keine Erfolgsgeschichten äh, des asiatischen Regionalismus, der ja auch immer von seinem Grundverständnis her als offener Regionalismus, als weicher Regionalismus bezeichnet worden ist. Das bedeutet natürlich, dass die, Mitgliedschaft, äh, dass die Mitgliedstaaten jeweils ihre nationalen ähm, ähm, Souveränität betonen, dass sie natürlich nicht bereit sind, Kompetenzen an supra oder supranationale Or Institutionen abzutreten, wie wir es vielleicht ähm, aus Europa kennen. Aber wir müssen natürlich ehrlicherweise sagen, Europa ist im Konzert der, Regional der regionalen Organisation die Ausnahme und nicht die Regel. Strittige Themen werden natürlich in diesen Regionalorganisationen im asiatischen Raum ausgeklammert. Territorial- und Minderheitenkonflikte ähm, belasten eher die Beziehungen und finden deshalb ebenfalls wenig Platz auf der Agenda. Der Wert vieler Regionalorganisationen liegt aber darin, dass, liegt 
Deshalb weniger vielleicht in der Umsetzung konkreter Abkommen, wie wir das im europäischen Kontext erwarten würden, als vielmehr natürlich in der vertrauensbildenden Funktion, die sie wahrnehmen. Man darf nicht vergessen, dass aufgrund der Konflikte natürlich es in diesen Regionen nicht so leicht ist, bei anstehenden Krisen ähm, sich mit den, äh, benachbarten, äh, mit den benachbarten Staats- und Re äh, Regierungschefs zusammenzusetzen. Das heißt, diese Organisation und deren Treffen bilden natürlich Foren und Plattformen, in denen Treffen hochrangiger Entscheidungsträger möglich sind und in denen dann auch neue Initiativen besprochen werden. Der jüngste Gipfel der SAIC in Mali war wieder ein Beispiel hierfür, dass der, dass der informelle Teil der Veranstaltung, nämlich die Treffen zwischen dem indischen Premierminister und seinem pakistanischen Counterpart, vielleicht wichtiger waren als das offizielle Programm. Lassen Sie mich, es soll ja ein kurzer Input sein, damit auch schon zu den, zum, äh, zum Ausblick zu den Chancen und Grenzen der regionalen Kooperation kommen. Regionale Kooperation wird, wie gesagt, nicht die Lösung für die Konflikte und die Herausforderungen in Afghanistan sein. Die Europäische Union hat keine Minderheitenkonflikte weder im Baskenland noch in Nordirland gelöst. Regionale Kooperation löst nicht diese Konflikte und sie ersetzt auch nicht wirtschaftliche Reformen. Regionale Zusammenarbeit kann aber einen wichtigen Beitrag eben für vertrauensbildende Maßnahmen leisten, wenn dadurch neue Institutionen und Netzwerke zwischen den beteiligten Staaten entstehen. Ob und inwieweit solche Netzwerke dann in der Lage sind, in den Staaten einen außenpolitischen Kurswechsel herbeizuführen, da, kann man, äh, da, da darf man allerdings der anderen außenpolitischen Interessen und der geringen wirtschaftlichen Bedeutung, die der regionale Handel hat, auch durchaus kritisch sein. Das spricht aber natürlich nicht dagegen, solche Formen der wirtschaftlichen Zusammenarbeit, zum Beispiel bei der Umsetzung großer in, äh, Infrastrukturprojekte, weiter zu unterstützen. Diese, wie ich es anfangs genannt habe, zweite Übergabe von Afghanistan, nämlich die Übergabe Afghanistan äh, an die Nachbarn, wird vielleicht auch den Problemdruck in den Nachbarstaaten erhöhen, über andere außenpolitische Strategien nachzudenken, um gegenüber Afghanistan und dem regionalen Umfeld zu agieren, als in der ersten Hälfte der 90er Jahre. Alle Nachbarstaaten werden einen hohen Preis für einen neuen Bürgerkrieg in Afghanistan bezahlen. Die internationale Gemeinschaft ist deshalb gut beraten, den Prozess der regionalen Zusammenarbeit trotz der vielleicht eher begrenzten Erfolgsaussichten zu fördern und zu begleiten. Denn nur dieser Prozess wird zu der Einsicht beitragen, dass die wirtschaftliche Einmischung in Afghanistan für alle beteiligten Staaten Vorteile bringen kann, wohingegen die politische Einmischung für alle bislang nur Nachteile gebracht hat. Vielen Dank für die Aufmerksamkeit. Ja, vielen Dank, Christian Wagner, für diese ziemlich ernüchternde Einschätzung. Die Interessen der Nachbarländer, wenn ich das zusammenfassen darf, liegen zu weit auseinander, um kurzfristig äh, Lösungen zur Stabilität von Afghanistan erwarten zu können. Ähm, lassen Sie uns die Gelegenheit nutzen, ähm, äh, uns einmal genauer anzuschauen, was denn eigentlich die Interessen der Nachbarländer sind. Ähm, wir haben heute Morgen äh, viel Kritik an Pakistan gehört. Ähm, Ejaz Haider sitzt direkt neben mir und ich möchte ihn direkt fragen, ähm, was sind denn eigentlich die Interessen Pakistans in Afghanistan und ähm, vielleicht könnte man auch mal ähm, äh, diese Interessen darauf abklopfen, ob sie eigentlich legitim sind, welche sind legitim und welche nicht. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, am I supposed to answer all this in five minutes? <laughs> well, let me uh, quickly uh, begin with uh, something that a very famous English language poet, Ted Hughes, wrote. Uh, one of his poems was called Apple Tragedy. And the poem actually upended the book of Genesis. And God in that poem becomes the interloper, and serpent uh, is the one who uh, actually acquires center stage. And so we go through the poem, and because the book of Genesis has been upended, the poem ends by saying, now whenever the snake approaches, she screeches, and that's Eve, of course. Here it comes again, help, help. 
Then Adam smashes a chair on its head, on the serpent's head. And God says, I am well pleased. And everything goes to hell. So in our region, every time I uh, look at uh, uh, different uh, interstate relations and their complexities, I'm always reminded of um, Hughes's Apple tragedy and how the book of Genesis g gets appended. Why I say this is because there is a lot of expectation here uh, in Europe and also in the rest of the world about some of the things that need to be done. Now, I can walk you through what is desirable. But what is desirable very often uh, falls in a way uh, strangely foul of what is doable. But since we want to see pigs fly, let me try and fly one here for you. Ideally, Afghanistan should be a stable country. It should have a plural democratic government, government structures. The women should be free. It should be modern. It should be at peace with its neighbors. It should have very good relations with Pakistan. Pakistan should have very good relations with Afghanistan. Pakistan should also have very good relations with India. India should have very good relations with Pakistan. Now, all of this is the desirable. So the question really is, why does the desirable not translate into the doable? And that is where, unfortunately, even in the 21st century, we go back to Thucydides and the Peloponnesian Wars and the famous Melian Dialogue, where we realize that the states, even in this century, consider the world anarchic, and they think that security may be scarce for them. Where I'm sitting now, until Second World War, this continent also looked at the security architecture differently. Post-Second World War, we now have planet Earth, then we have planet Europe, and within planet Europe, we have planet Western Europe. And planet Western Europe in many ways, uh, and I congratulate uh, the Western Europeans, has gone much ahead of various other parts of the world, including the one to which I belong. In our part of the world, there are rivalries, there are unresolved issues, there are disputes. And we have to work in and through those disputes. Now, I told you what is desirable. Let's see what is doable. And Christian has already pointed out some of the moves that have taken place between India and Pakistan. I consider those as positive moves. I was talking to my friend Commodore Rode Bhaskar uh, during uh, the coffee break. And he mentioned to me, and he's a former uh, Indian military officer, he's mentioned to me that very recently there was an incident in which an Indian helicopter lost its way and crossed over into the Pakistani territory. And the general uh, uh, you know, uh, impression at the, at the time was that uh, we will um, host the Indian crew for a few days at least, maybe even put the squeeze on India. This was the general impression. And uh, after debriefing them and ensuring that there was no hostile intent, that we let them go. As it happened, within two hours uh, of uh, this, uh, the Indian crew was returned. And so that, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a positive development. The reason I start with uh, the India Pakistan thing is because there's a general impression, and it's not uh, very um, far from the truth, that some of what happens in Afghanistan has to do with India Pakistan rivalry. And in that, and I have lots of Afghan friends uh, who, even when I do not agree with the details of what they say, I do understand their concern uh, that their country may have suffered to a large extent because of this rivalry. We can 
you know, discuss the percentages, how much Afghanistan has suffered uh, in terms of its own issues, how much of it is external. But those are issues of detail, and one can, you know, debate them till cows come home. But I think within the SARC framework, uh, it is important, as uh, Christian pointed out, that India and Pakistan, as India, uh, Pakistan, as one of the most important neighbors of Afghanistan with historical, uh, geographical, and traditional ties, and India as um, the biggest state, I will not say the dominant regional power, I'm sorry, but, uh, uh, but the biggest state, <laughs> uh, uh, can get together and work out uh, joint cooperative strategies. And I think those developing those joint cooperative strategies is in the realm of the doable. And which is why I think uh, some kind of rapprochement and the furtherance of the normalization process between India and Pakistan would help a lot in also addressing some of the problems of Afghanistan in an indirect way. Um, I just sorry for interrupting yeah. you. Um, your time is up, but you haven't answered my question yet. So you have two more minutes to answer our question. What is Pakistan's interest in Afghanistan? Pakistan's interest in Afghanistan, uh, when uh, uh, partition happened, uh, one of the first countries that uh, actually uh, voted against Pakistan was Afghanistan. Afghanistan and India were traditionally very close. Afghanistan also... Uh, at that time, uh, asked Pakistan that the federally administered tribal areas should be made a separate state. Uh, Afghanistan also tried and helped and actually sent forces also in the case of Bajor, for instance, uh, in trying to create the, this whole issue of Pakhtunistan for Pakistan. Uh, so there was uh, a problem there, and that problem stayed uh, with us. The Durand line problem still stays with us. Uh, ironically enough, even under the Taliban, uh, a, a regime that was recognized only by three countries, including Pakistan, the Durand line issue uh, kept hanging fire. So one of the basic determinants of Pakistan's Afghanistan policy is that A, this line should be accepted by the uh, whoever rules Kabul, Two, Afghanistan, Afghanistan's land should not create trouble for Pakistan, as it did when the Soviets walked in, or earlier when there was uh, uh, President Daoud's coup, or later when there was the PDP government. Uh, and therefore, this area should remain quiet for us, and we should be able to, and I, and I think there is a consensus in Pakistan on this, that essentially what we want is a government in Kabul, no matter what government, that is up to the Afghans to decide. I repeat, that is Afghanistan's internal matter. That government should have normal, good neighborly, friendly relations with Pakistan. Pakistan also does not have any objection to Afghan governments dealing with any other state in the region or outside of the region until such time, I emphasize, until such time, that particular presence does not translate into any hostile intent directly or indirectly towards Pakistan. Thank you very much, Ijaz. Um, the open question of the Afghan-Pakistani border, um, the open question or the possibility of Pashtuns uniting uh, that would lead to a disintegration of the Pakistani state are concerns of Pakistan. And there is also a, a third concern, the question of encirclement through India on both sides. Udai, could you give us a perspective from the Indian side and probably also elaborate a bit on how India could uh, constructively work with Pakistan in order to ease uh, this fear? 
Thank you, Britta. Uh, at the outset, I may not get an opportunity again, so let me use a minute or so to thank the Bowl Foundation. I see President Barbara sitting at the back, so Madam, you and your, all your colleagues, including uh, Anika and Caroline, whom I can see here, for enabling this uh, interaction, because it was a challenge, I think, and grateful to all of you. This has been a very interesting discussion for me, you know, this morning, and the sessions that have followed. In the interest of time, I think I'll try and get straight to the point made by Britta and answer these two questions. I have a lot more to say, but since we don't have the time, I'll pass on that, including I hope I'll get time to respond to Ajaz's, I thought, very interesting uh, formulation about the mismatch between the desirable and the feasible. But maybe later in the evening we can take that up. Immediately, this question of the encirclement of Pakistan, you know, which is one of the anxieties that's often expressed, and you see that coming into the discourse. I want to make two points on this. For those of you who haven't already read it, I would urge you to look at Britta Patterson's summary of the current situation. It's a two-page thing which is part of the folder. And I want to quote from that, you know, where she talks about the different anxieties, and Christian also had referred to that, saying that there are divergences in the foreign policy and the political orientations of the principal players. And this morning somebody had used the word narrative. I think it was my friend, Amrullah Saleh, saying that there is a narrative that has been constructed by Pakistan about its own security anxieties. And there are two main streams. One is that India poses this existential threat to Pakistan. Therefore, Pakistan has to come up with certain responses. And one of them is this phrase, which is strategic depth. It had been used in the past, whether it's valid or not, it has a certain tenacity about it. You know, there is this constant reference to Pakistan's need for strategic depth. And paradoxically, the depth is found in Afghanistan. You know, while India is towards the east, Pakistan's strategic depth is to the west. And any attempt by India, which brings me to the second question that Britta had raised, the so-called encirclement of Pakistan by India. So that's the backdrop. And as an analyst, I'd like to offer for your consideration the following interpretation. My own reading is that if Pakistan has an abiding interest in Afghanistan, which goes back to the last 50, 60 years, and I say this as a security analyst, is that if you look at the region pre-August 1947, there was the Indian subcontinent under the British Raj, and there was Afghanistan. There was no Pakistan. Pakistan is sui generis in the sense that in the whole you know, regional history, it has no parallel. It comes into existence after August 1947, sui generis, no precedent. And my reading over the years is that, and I think Britta makes this point in her brief essay, that the Durand line, it came up this morning also for discussion, I think there is a very deep anxiety that Pakistan and its border with Afghanistan has still not been accepted, either de jure or de facto. And therefore, if there is an interest, one school of thought, you know, and I don't think we'll have time to go into the detail, is that Pakistan's establishment has always been very concerned about the fact that this nationalism of the region could pose a subnational problem for the entity of Pakistan as it was cohering in the early 50s and 60s. So therefore, the interest is, in a way, I would say, emanating from within Pakistan, from this deep-seated anxiety about Afghanistan and the way in which the history of that region, since there was no entity of Pakistan, the history of the region had played out along the NWFP and that whole area. So therefore, you create a narrative and a discourse. And since I'm interested in theory, I hope I can test this on this audience in Berlin, that this is where you find a very interesting Foucauldian paradigm, which is you keep contributing to a certain discourse, and myth becomes reality. So you create a mythology, which I believe the Pakistani establishment, particularly the military, has over the years created the myth of India, and the fact that it is an existential threat. And after 1971 and the creation of East Pakistan, this is my reading, and I hope Ajaz can come in on this, I believe the Pakistani military in a way starts believing this, that having lost East Pakistan, the forces of subnationalism need to be contained within Pakistan. So whether it's Baloch, Sindh, 
or the Pakhtun are differently sort of causing this anxiety in the quote-unquote Pakistani establishment. So therefore, you create, as I said, a certain discourse, a certain narrative. And that's the Foucauldian connection. The establishment represents power. So they create a discourse and a narrative which says that unless the state of Pakistan, the establishment of Pakistan does certain things, there is a threat. So in a way, what does it do? It ensures the primacy of the Pakistani military in the calculus of Pakistan, in the domestic matrix. And concurrently, it allows them certain options, various options, whether it's the nuclear option or it is the so-called investment in terror. That therefore you legitimize investment, say, in the Haqqani group, which is in Afghanistan, or you legitimize the support to the Taliban in 1996. And in this fashion, you know, you are creating a certain, as I said, narrative and a discourse. But this is where I'd like to make a transition, and I'm approaching this very theoretically. I also like to invoke Badri Lard. The central thesis of Badri Lard is to create a virtual reality, the simulacrum. And I believe that Afghanistan, in a way, represents a kind of strategic simulacrum where there are different interpretations of the same reality, of the same events on the ground. So the virtual reality is that Pakistan has got legitimate interests in Afghanistan, which translate into, and I think it's a variation from what my dear friend Ajaz had said, while he talks about a plural democratic government which the Afghan people themselves will choose, the policy that is being practiced is different. And that is the mismatch between the desirable, what Ajaz has pointed out and what is happening, that you will encourage a certain faction within the politics of Afghanistan that is beholden to the Pakistani establishment. Therefore, you engage in you know, various policy options, and I would like to describe that as the virtual reality, that the Pakistani establishment believes that only by having a regime that is beholden to the military again, and you have a relationship that is subaltern. I think pre-launch somebody used the word protectorate. I can't remember who, but maybe that's an apt description. And I think that is the misleading part, which many of the external interlocutors seem to be subscribing to. But it's only after Abbottabad and Osama bin Laden, I think at least the Americans are doing a reality check. I'm not sure about the other Western powers because I don't track them so closely. So that is what I mean by the myth of encirclement. Would because I, I as far as India is... If I have another minute, no, stop. <laughs> I think, well, actually, we are at par now. You also spoke for five minutes and you didn't answer my questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let me ask you again. Just one second. Um, uh, Afghanistan has just signed a strategic partnership with India. Um, uh, India is the sixth biggest donor in Afghanistan. So the question now is, uh, what is the interest of India uh, in Afghanistan? And isn't the fear of Pakistan somehow just to fight. Again, let me, yeah, I think I'm glad you asked that. I'd like to repeat this point that India's current engagement in Afghanistan is not to encircle Pakistan. That's the statement as I see it. India's current interest is to really enable the people of Afghanistan in the development effort. As you can see over the last few years, India's commitment, which is now almost $2 billion, has been in the development sector. India has been hesitant to engage with Afghanistan in the security sector only because it would create this anxiety in Pakistan that India is getting engaged in the training or providing security in Pakistan, sorry, in Afghanistan. This despite the fact that we had the bombing of the Indian embassy in Kabul, which as I said, there is a whole interpretation about how we think it happened, etc. So I repeat to answer Britta's question, India's current investment and strategy apropos Afghanistan is not the encirclement of Pakistan. We are engaging with the Afghan government and we believe that our effort and investment there is for the people of Afghanistan. And this is a point I often repeat saying that while there is so much sensitivity about Pakistan's legitimate interest in Afghanistan, why don't we put the interests of the Afghan people first? Then I think a lot of the questions answer themselves. And our Prime Minister Manmohan Singh repeatedly, even when the agreement was being signed between him and Mr. Karzai, had made this point that we have gone through this many times as a large power in the region or a big power in the region, dominant or otherwise, that we understand the sensitivities of the smaller neighbours. So therefore, whatever we do will be at the 
request or with the full consensus of the Afghan government, and which is why the entire security thing is on hold. India is not moving on that. Our attempt is development. Thank you very much. So I think we've got a good overview now over um, both positions from India and from Pakistan. And uh, I would like to ask Darcy Berner now um, the position of the U.S., um, especially after Barack Obama took over, um, seems to be um, increasingly unclear. If, if you look at what uh, has been uh, said in the last few months, it seems that, that um, the U.S. is trying to secure its interests in either Asia, rather in the South China Sea in the future than in Afghanistan. Um, nonetheless, uh, the U.S. have entered into um, the India-U.S. nuclear deal under George W. Bush, uh, which was of a great concern for Pakistan. Uh, the relations between Pakistan and the U.S. are, are at the bottom at the moment. Um, so could you um, tell us how you see it? Um, what is, what uh, do the U.S. actually want in Afghanistan and in the region? Um, it's funny. I was talking to... Uh, a friend of mine who is a retired uh, U.S. Army general before coming over, and I said, what do you perceive the U.S. interest in Afghanistan to be? And he paused and he said, I think we're there because we're there, <laughs> and we can't figure out how to get out. Um, I wish that I could say that the U.S.'s interest was in the well-being of the people of Afghanistan, that the U.S.'s interest was in making sure that women had equal rights, that the human rights of all Afghans were respected, that the economic development that the country deserves was happening. But I think if I were to say that, um, I would be grossly misrepresenting where my country is at. The... Um, one of the things that has struck me as the conversation has proceeded today is that the, the underlying question of this conference is a question that wouldn't be asked at a comparable event in the U.S. In the U.S., we would not be asking about how we make Afghanistan functional. We would be asking only about how we secured American interests and got out. Um, the narrative, if we're to talk about narrative, that most Americans have in their heads, and this includes most members of Congress, most of our elected officials, about our involvement in Afghanistan goes something like this. We woke up on the morning of September 11th, 2001, and there had been an attack in New York, and an enormous number of people died in an unprecedented way on American soil, and we decided to go get some bad guys. The bad guys, of course, were Al-Qaeda. We sent troops in to get them, and because the Taliban government in Afghanistan had been harboring them, we decided as retaliation to remove that government. Most Americans, if you ask them why we are still there, have no answer and want us to leave and to leave now. Last time I looked at the polling, it was greater than 80% of Americans simply want us to leave. The view is al-Qaeda no longer has a significant presence in Afghanistan. The Taliban is not governing Afghanistan anymore. And we killed Osama bin Laden. Therefore, according to most Americans, we're done. We've checked all the boxes. Um, so with that being said... I think it begs a little bit the question of why we are still there. And I think in order to understand our actions in Afghanistan, it's important to understand that what we say we're there for and what we're actually there for are probably not precisely identical. We say that we're there to do counterinsurgency, to bring peace to Afghanistan and stabilize the region. But we say that while we're doing night raids, we say that while we're increasing the reasons 
that the insurgency exists. We say that while we have far too few troops there to do counterinsurgency under any of the U.S. military strategies related to counterinsurgency. We're clearly not there to do counterinsurgency, or we're doing it really badly. But I think we're probably not actually there to do counterinsurgency. We're probably, in fact, there to do counterterrorism. And we're there to do counterterrorism principally because the folks in the White House are afraid of what happens if Afghanistan fails as a state, destabilizes Pakistan, and the nuclear weapons in Pakistan end up in the hands of terrorists. It's really that straightforward. When thinking about how the U.S. is approaching this problem then, it's important to distinguish between the rhetoric, to distinguish between the stories we tell about what we want and what our actions actually say it is that we want. Now, I would argue personally that human rights in Afghanistan, a functional democracy, real security, human security, lead to stability, that we can't have peace without justice, and that we need to do everything we can to build that justice in order to get the outcome that we want. But my government, most of the members of Congress, the vast majority of the American citizens, would quite happily take a much shorter path if they saw one. So if I'm getting you right, what you're saying is actually that the U.S. does not pursue any long-term strategic interests in the region? Um, certainly, based on the conversations that I have been having and I deal on a daily basis with members of the U.S. Congress, um, with folks in the administration, um, their, the view has become that the cost isn't worth it that we're spending $120 billion a year on the military presence in Afghanistan um, while we are laying off teachers in our schools because we don't have sufficient funding to keep them there, um, that we have uh, American soldiers coming home in coffins on a daily basis, and the president has to explain to their families what they've died for and can't. Um, and so it isn't that there isn't some hypothetical strategic interest in a presence in Afghanistan, but the reality is that the, the perception, the widespread perception, is that the cost isn't worth it at this point. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a strong statement. Sanja, I would like to ask you to comment from an Afghan perspective on uh, the three statements that we had, um, especially from the U.S. Um, coming this now. Uh, would the Afghans feel abandoned or would they be happy if it is going to happen to be left alone with the neighbors in the region? Thank you, Berta. Uh, well, I, I, I start with, uh, with uh, Darcy uh, comments. Uh, I think uh, the, the uncertainty of the U.S. policy in Afghanistan has put Afghans in a very dangerous situation. And that's why we cannot, you know, form uh, a, a kind of plan for our future. Uh, uh, and everybody is asking themselves what America is going to do in Afghanistan. Well, uh, actually, in the past 10 years, uh, mostly the Afghan issue was was became an issue of internal politics of uh, Western capitals. Everybody was used Afghanistan as a as a as a tools of election and 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 its own and internal policy issues. And nobody was was actually focusing on the realities of Afghanistan to solve those problems. So uh, uh, the, the, the uncertainty of, of the American policy is, is really dangerous for us uh, because right now we are talking in Afghanistan about the strategic partnership with Americans. And uh, everybody is preparing for that. Iranians, uh, you know, Pakistan, Russia, China, everybody is preparing for that. And we have, we have, we have witnessed, you know, the, 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 
the impact of, of the dialogue uh, uh, between uh, Afghanistan and, and USA on this strategic partnership. So I think you know that, that the Americans should 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 really end this uncertainty, uh, uh, because otherwise Afghans will 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 not know to 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 form their their future. Uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm going to the to the points that uh, Ajaz uh, was was raised. Uh, I'm 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 totally agree with Ajaz that uh, there are so many uh, unsolved problems. Uh, you know that we have in in the region, especially the deal online is is a big issue. Uh, it's it's also a very sensitive issue among Afghans. You know, uh, Afghans are not able to talk in public uh, on on deal online. Uh, but I think uh, there are rooms, there are space that we should we could we could start. A kind of negotiation, a kind of talk on the Iran line. Uh, but the Pakistan side should also start some positive steps uh, because this, this deal, this negotiation should be based on, on give and take deal. Otherwise, it would not work. Uh, before and and as, as far as I know from from my uh, Afghan uh, government officials, the Pakistanis are always rising uh, the issue of Pashtun participation in in the government of Afghanistan. I don't know the Pakistanis uh, got from where this right that rising every time the Pashtun participation in Afghanistan. This is not, you know, the right of any other country. Afghanistan is an independent country. And Afghanistan should, should, should solve and should address every internal issues by themselves. No country should, uh, should ha hold such a right to raise such a question from a sovereign country why the Pashtuns are, are, are not uh, very much participating in, in the government. If Pakistan has a uh, lack of participation of Pashtuns, they should, they should address their, their own internal problems. Why the Baluchs are, 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 are not participating in, in the Pakistani politics very much? Or the Pashtun, why the Pashtuns are not participating very much in Pakistan politics? So I think you know, we should, we should, we should uh, give up from those uh, narratives that has been, you know, made in the past. Because if we go to the history, we cannot solve the future. We have to start from now and looking to the future. Otherwise, it would be, you know, it would be impossible if, if the Pakistanis rise that Afghanistan voted against Pakistan in 1947. That would not solve the problem. Uh, and uh, just two quick uh, comments on, 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 on Kristin. Um, Kristin was, was, uh, was uh, telling that uh, the, the regional cooperation is not working in the, in the region. Uh, well, it, there is not very positive examples in the past to say that this, this does not, you know, worked. But I think, you know, it's the only way to solve the regional disputes. Uh, there are so many opportunities in the region we have, and we should really working hard to make those opportunities uh, uh, something to, to use. Uh, for example, the Pakistanis need energy, and Afghanistan could provide the land to, for, for Pakistan to bring energy from Central Asian countries. There is a very good uh, 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 forum has been created called CASA 1000, which is the Central Asian, South Asian electricity market. So 
One of the things that the Central Asian countries has is, is energy. And Pakistan, India needs energy very much. So Afghanistan could provide that, that space, that climate, uh, uh, that opportunity for, 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 for Pakistan to get energy through Central Asian countries. And I think, you know, uh, the, 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 the regional cooperation is the only way. It's the, the startup of, 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 of building trust between every uh, country in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanja. And would, would you like to quickly comment on the Pashtun question? Otherwise, given the time constraint, I would quickly like to open the floor to questions. I think you will have to bear with me for three or four minutes. Because I uh, made my opening uh, statement in the German spirit by keeping my gun on the safety, uh, this thing. Uh, but there have been a couple of artillery salvos, so I need to sort of, you know, uh, go back, respond to that. Uh, firstly, I don't have to hide under the table. Uh, firstly, uh, firstly, I think uh, I must congratulate uh, Commodore Bhaskar for presenting um, a narrative, since we are now into the Fukardian narrative thing, uh, which presents India as the sage, uh, ancient sage, Professor Godbole of E.M. Foster's A Passage to India, while Pakistan is this young kid which is, you know, jumping around doing all sorts of funny things for no reason at all. Um, the issue is that when we talk about myth and reality, and everyone here in this room knows this, all nationalisms are essentially myths. All states are myths. They are imaginative, imagined communities. All states develop their narratives and have what Renault called selective amnesia in order to put together a nation. So I don't think that Pakistan is uh, an exception to it. I don't think that the great India or the Indian subcontinent that Commodore Bhaskar was talking about actually came together in a, in a large way as one administrative unity under the, the first the Sultanate of Delhi and then the Mughal rule and then of course it was further extended by the British Raj uh, and even during the British Raj there were over 500 princely states. So we, we have even on the Indian subcontinent an attempt, a very conscious attempt to move from the idea of a state nation to the idea of a nation state. So I think that should put to rest the fact that, you know, it's not about myths and virtual realities. It's about the fact that this is a process that takes place everywhere. Uh, secondly, uh, about India's extremely benign intentions in Afghanistan. Since uh, I am on record as having quoted uh, Richard Armitage after I interviewed him in his Virginia office back in 2009, and I've written about it, I will present this to According to Mr. Armitage, the Americans were in the know of a certain collusion between the Indian research and analysis wing and certain elements in the Afghan government which were supporting the Baloch insurgency in Pakistan and also, to a very large extent, providing indirect funding to certain other groups operating in FATA. There is increasing evidence of this, and I will also present to you uh, the fact that when in Sharm Sharmul Sheikh, when uh, Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh and uh, uh, Prime Minister Gilani gave a joint, there was a joint uh, uh, statement. In that joint statement, India accepted Balochistan as an issue that needs to be talked about. And later, when Prime Minister Manmohan Singh went back home, he was attacked by the right of center and right wing parties in India. And so there was a backtracking there. The reason I didn't want to get into this is because there are lots of these allegations. The, you know, someone can allege that Pakistan is doing X, Y, Z. These are things that will not stand in a court of law because no intelligence agency leaves a signature. Uh, and therefore, uh, but there are circumstantial evidence, there is, there's other evidence, and, and we have that evidence. Some of that evidence I, I am privy to, 
uh, a lot of it I'm not privy to. So there are narratives everywhere. My point in, in the opening statement that I was trying to make was that there are problems and those problems need to be resolved. And while there is a differential between what is doable and what is desirable, there's a lot which can be done. Uh, and realistically speaking, it can be done. If not for any positive reason, for the reason of a negative incentive that this kind of rivalry is not redounding to the advantage of any of the three states involved in the region. Uh, I must also uh, say to um, Sanjay that Pakistan has no interest in Pashtun participation in Afghanistan per se. However, it becomes a problem when lack of Pashtun participation actually results in conflict on the Afghan soil, which then begins to have an impact on us. So then it becomes a problem. And I think it is up to you to resolve this issue. Uday's point that we have to put the interests of the Afghans first, completely agreed. But which Afghan government, the current one? Or what about the interests of those who are fighting this Afghan government? Do we need to also look at the interests of those who are fighting the Afghan government? Now, we have very clear evidence, and we also have, from what uh, Ms. Berna has said, that one of the problems that the United States is facing is the complete inability, and there's so much evidence of this, the complete inability, even when the counterterrorism, counterinsurgency strategy of the United States has had tactical wins, that at a strategic level it has not resulted in any positives because the Afghan partners have completely failed to impact and reach out to the people. Now, this is, and again, in April this year, I was talking to Dr. Abdullah Abdullah on the sidelines of a conference in Washington, and he said, he said, I am a political opponent of President Karzai, but here I am talking to you as an Afghan. In addition to other things, we have also failed remarkably to reach out to the people, and it is in that vacuum that other forces have entered. I have always said, and this is where I go back to what I said about the Indian uh, involvement in Balochistan and elsewhere. And hostile intent exploits the situation. It does not necessarily create a situation. There's a problem here. We have to deal with that problem. But that problem, when you have that problem and when you have a rivalry which is geared towards a zero-sum game, then the hostile intentions will serve to make it into a wicked problem, which then becomes almost unresolvable. And finally, before uh, I uh, let go of the mic, to uh, Ms. Berners' uh, uh, observation that America doesn't, uh, can't afford to be in Afghanistan, I have a slightly different take on this, uh, based on what I uh, read and also my conversations with uh, the American strategic enclave. Uh, Having a status of forces agreement with, with Afghanistan is not a very costly venture. And it also allows, uh, in fact, uh, people have cited uh, the issue of the, the, uh, the Libyan campaign, which in terms of cost was very, uh, you know, was affordable, so to speak. And therefore, if you have a couple of bases for which the infrastructure is already there, and if you continue to use national technical means and also, you know, the aerial platforms, then having some uh, forces based in Afghanistan uh, is not a very costly. However, if one were to begin to look at it in terms of how the regional countries will respond to that, then the issue of cost becomes a completely different ball game altogether. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just, I'm, I'm extremely grateful for your remarks because I think now we see how complex um, the situation is. Instead of making the round again, I, I would really like to open the floor now for questions. I see one arm there, there, and there. We probably start with three, three questions and uh, then I do, we do another round. Hello. Thank you very much for giving me the chance. <clears throat> My name is Akhil Zahirpur. 
Um, I study public policy at University of Erfurt, Germany. Um, I'm afraid uh, um, I have sensed contradictions in uh, Ajaz's speech. In the beginning, I heard that Ajaz said that uh, Pakistan will be supportive and quite okay for any government in Afghanistan, no matter what and who. And on the other hand, uh, and uh, just a few minutes ago, he said that uh, Pakistan supports uh, the Pashtun ethnic group in Afghanistan to make sure, you know, that conflict might not arise. If, if you stick to your first uh, stand or take that Pakistan is okay with any kind of government in Afghanistan, then what will be your take on the fact that when USA was on the verge of uh, attacking Afghanistan and removing the Taliban extremist regime, uh, what's your take on the fact that when Rumsfeld contacted Parviz Musharraf asking to, to allow them to use their soil against Taliban, and there are many conditions raised by the Pakistani government, one of which was that for USA to make sure that the coming ruler or the president in Afghanistan should be uh, from Pashtuns. And don't you think it's a big uh, concern to have you know, contacts and rules in installing the governments in Afghanistan from the Pakistani side? Thank you. Ich heiße Volker Bergander, ich bin Analyst, kein Student in Erfurt. Eine Frage an, <lacht> sieht man vom Alter her, eine Frage an Herrn Wagner. Das, das Thema, was wir haben, ist ja die unruhige Nachbarschaft. Aber zur Nachbarschaft zählen ja auch die zentralasiatischen Staaten, die ja gerade in St. Petersburg die Shanghai, ein Shanghai-Organisationstreffen hatten und da sich gegen die, eine neue, gegen die Idee einer neuen Silk Road, also Seidenstraße, ausgedrückt haben. Meine Frage ist, was halten Sie von dieser Idee, die Frau Clinton ja propagiert hat und die sicherlich Herr Steiner heute Abend als seine Idee hier noch verbreiten wird? Zweite Sache zu Miss Burner. Ich möchte nicht arrogant wirken, aber wenn ich mir den Lebenslauf von Herrn Kasai angucke, der mal Chief Advisor war bei Unicall, Unicall hat nichts mit UNO zu tun, Unicall ist Union Oil of California, belongs to Mr. Chini, dann sehe ich durchaus the first reason and the second reason is, if you have a look on the map of the world and you look and you, make a, you, you take a marker and everywhere where an American military base is, you make a mark, you will see a ring about China and a second ring now around Iran. And this is also my question, and I'm very surprised about it, that now America will take a new base in Australia with 2,500 soldiers, although they have no money. Thank you very much. Hi, Malaysia again. I'm also not from Air Force, by the way. <laughs> um, I just like to make a statement uh, building on what Sanjar said, uh, basically on what is going on in Afghanistan. Um, we talked about the establishment of Pakistan, but nowadays one of the terms we use in Afghanistan is the system. And there is a, certainly a big group of Afghans, uh, the so called elite, who say we are standing behind the system that has been created in the past 10 years. What I'm trying to say is that um, now this system within itself has started the debate and we are hearing the Americans clear and loud that they are basically leaving and uh, it's up to us what we are, how we are going to deal with our problems. Um, we are basically preparing for those case scenario uh, out, say, 1992 and then 1996. We have the depth and experience of such scenarios, and we have the resilience to use them to our advantage, if not in, in one or two years, but at least in the long term. That's one thing. And this is what we are looking at right now. Um, the second thing is that um, for Pakistan's advantage to know what is going on in the minds of Afghans, we believe Pakistan may have a pivotal role in conflict post-2014 post, uh, scenario. But what they should also understand is that an outright victory for Pakistan in Afghanistan is simply impossible. The second point is sustaining a low-level warfare 
Uh, um, I just have comments. This, this is my last comment. Sustaining a low, low level warfare uh, for a long time is also not a realistic option for, for Pakistan. Thank you. And uh, Darcy and probably uh, Sandra wants to comment on what has been said. Um, I don't think I said uh, anything contradictory. I said something very simple, uh, which is that if you look at the history of your, your country, and I'm assuming that you are from Afghanistan, which, is, which could be one of the reasons that you found my statement contradictory, uh, is, that, uh, uh, is that traditionally uh, the Pashtun have ruled Afghanistan uh, correct me if I'm wrong, except for one uh, small interregnum uh, when there was a Tajik ruler. So I think uh, that is something that traditionally the Afghans themselves have decided historically. Our concern is not who rules Kabul per se. Our concern is that if there is a dominant ethnic group and if keeping that dominant ethnic group out of power, as happened when the Northern Alliance went into Kabul, as happened shortly thereafter, then it is going to result into a situation in Afghanistan which will also have a negative impact on Pakistan. And that is our legitimate concern. It is also our legitimate concern because there is the tyranny of geography and also history. And therefore, I don't think that what we would like to see in Afghanistan is for the Afghans, given their demographic uh, configuration, to decide on a power-sharing agreement, uh, which reflects the aspirations and the rights of the various ethnic groups inside Afghanistan. And uh, to your uh, question, sir, Pakistan does not seek any victory in Afghanistan. Pakistan is not there to conquer Kabul. Our concern simply is that you need to be at peace. And let me also put it straight on the table. This is part of the constructed narrative that if there was no Pakistan, Afghanistan would be at peace. Let me take you back to your own history. When PDP took over, what were they trying to do, incidentally? They were trying to modernize the countryside. They were trying to uh, educate women. They were actually trying to do all those things that the Americans were initially trying to do. Short, of course, of the Jeffersonian democracy, which the Soviets and the, you know, the communists did not believe in. The rest of the agenda was the same. But the Afghan countryside rose up against the PDPA. And... and I don't think that, uh, you know, if you're suggesting that the PDPA got into trouble because Pakistan was doing something inside Afghanistan, then I think you, I think that's... So, that was all really building up. I, I, I haven't been able to hear much of what you've said because you... No, the, the, look... No doubt that the PDPA government, the way it dealt with its society, that created the friction, that created the conflict. But Pakistan has already done, had already done by then its spot because the training of some of the Afghan so-called Mujahideen leaders later, uh, now we are that going was to, already now, happening in 1996 now we are going in to, Now we are going to go into a back, of, back and forth on this. Uh, Pakistan, after the Daoud takeover... And when Hikmatyar and others and rest of them, they came to Peshawar. Incidentally, Ahmad Shah Massoud also at that time came to Peshawar. Uh, and all of them sought Pakistan's help. And all of them sought Pakistan's help. They had an internal problem. And at that point, Pakistan, then Brigadier Nasirullah Babur, wrote a position paper in which he suggested to the federal government that because these people have been putting the squeeze on us on the issue of Pakhtunistan, now that this regime is getting into trouble because of, you know, multiple, uh, you know, pressure groups inside uh, and dissenters, 
So how about we fund them so that they put the squeeze on the Kabul government and so that they get away from the Pakhtunistan issue? There was no training. There were, I mean, there were Lee Enfield rifles. And you can imagine how much of funding Pakistan could give to these dissenters. The dissent began inside Afghanistan. And it was not just, I repeat, it was not just the Pashtun dissent. It involved non-Pashtun groups also. So once again, my point is that the trouble lies inside Afghanistan. And you have to work that out. Well, I, I think there's a lot more to say to this, actually, um, especially to the funding of these groups. Uh, uh, well, actually, um, we have to answer the questions. Actually, the next is Christian, who has to answer the question of the gentleman here. And yes. Thank you very much. Um, to make life easier for the translator, I will try to give the answers in English, so it's not necessary to change the headphones all the time. Um, one comment, one answer. Uh, the comment is, I think, uh, the subcontinent plays since about 60 years, plays an interesting game which is very strange, or at least strange to Germans, an interesting identity game uh, where the main proponents are ethnic identity versus religious identities. And I think this is also uh, in how far you can explain the very difficult um, debate that um, you see between uh, Afghanistan on the one hand, um, or Afghanistan and India on the one hand, and Pakistan on um, on um, the other hand. Coming to the question about um, the new Silk Road, I wouldn't wonder that um, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization would be critical about any American proposal supporting um, uh, um, the Silk Road, um, as the SEO probably has their own ideas how uh, cen Central Asia uh, should be uh, constructed. And of course, there is always the attempt by China and um, 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 Russia to keep the US out of Central Asia. So in that context, I'm not very astonished um, that the uh, member states of SEO are not very um, pleased or are not very uh, uh, welcoming the um, uh, proposals by the United States. Uh, of course, if the new Silk Road would offer new kind of uh, regional cooperation, I th and I think there I would not have a, um, a lot of controversy uh, with what uh, Sanja was saying, I would not be saying regional cooperation is not working. I would say it's very difficult, and it will not be the answer to your problems. That's the point. So. I sometimes have the I sometimes got the idea that everybody is now promoting regional co cooperation, and after 20 years of time, everything will be solved. No, that's not going to work. If you have worked on Asian regionalism or other parts of the world, it's a good point. It's a good strategy. Yes, in the sense that you were referring to increasing trade. Yes, increasing energy cooperation. Yes, but it will not solve your minority. Con conflicts, it will not free you from fundamental economic ref domestic reforms. So in that sense, I would more plea for an expectation management when we talk about the concept. Thank you. There were a lot of other pressing questions here. Mr. Sully, um, please, and the lady behind you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I find Mr. Ejaz's comments very uh, enlightening and frank, and I truly appreciate what he said, because this is the view of the establishment, but in a frank and uh, clear manner. My question, not for the sake of just confronting you, but truly uh, coming from my heart, let us suppose you represent Pakistan and I represent Afghanistan and we have this dialogue. What is your definition of due role for Pashtuns in Afghanistan? And what constitutes a Pashtun? A turbaned man with long beard, speaking no foreign language, only flying to the rest of the world from Islamabad and driving through Fatah. What is the definition of a Pashtun for you? So you think President Karzai is not good enough of a Pashtun? Yes. Yeah, why don't you? Yeah. Do you have a comment on, on that as well? 
Okay, then we collect it. Ja, ich heiße äh, Salai Sarzai Khalaqi von Radio BBC. Erstmal äh, ein paar Punkte zu Herrn äh, Ejaz äh, Haidar. Äh, ich spreche Deutsch. <lacht> äh, ich wollte äh, mal sagen, Ihre äh, Sprache ist es schon mal mit vielen Punkten, was Sie gesprochen haben, sind bestritten. Aber nur ein paar Punkte werde ich mal äh, nennen über die afghanischen äh, Frauenrechte. Afghanische Frauen haben die Rechte äh, damals sogar, als ihr Land noch nicht geboren war. Afghanische äh, Frauen haben äh, die, äh, seine Rechte in äh, der Zeit von Shah Amanullah, äh, Shah Ahmad Zai Shah, Daoud Khan, und, äh, also bei äh, Antel oder bis äh, kommunistische Zeiten. Dann wurden die Rechte der afghanischen Frauen äh, weggenommen, als Taliban und Al-Qaida in Irland geboren wurde. Zweitens, die Randgrenze wird nie von, Afghanistan, äh, von Afghanen äh, akzeptiert werden und das ist das, dass Pakistan Afghanistan unterdrückt hat, bis Afghanistan dieses, diese Grenze akzeptiert und das wird nie äh, die Wahrheit werden. Drittens, Pakistan spielt zweiseitige oder zweigesichter Politik in Afghanistan. Einerseits sagen die, die Taliban ist nicht hier, die sind in Afghanistan und andererseits die wollen mit Afghanistan äh, zusammenarbeiten, aber andererseits wenn man sieht, dann die Taliban sind doch da, Al-Qaida ist doch da und das, die große Beweisung ist schon mal die Tötung von Osama Bin Laden in Pakistan, in Aibatabad. Und äh, zu Frau äh, Bodner Dersi ist meine Frage. Denken Sie nicht, äh, wenn USA in der Mitte von 2014 aus Afghanistan seine Truppe abzieht, wird er wieder nicht das gleiche Fehler beginnen, wie schon mal in Dschihad-Zeiten, als äh, der Kalte Krieg zwischen USA und äh, Sowjetunion zu Ende war? Dann hat äh, USA äh, den Afghanistan den Rücken gedreht und haben die schon mal äh, erlebt, was ist passiert. Al-Qaida wurde schon mal äh, in Pakistan und äh, Taliban auch noch dazu. 11. Äh, September ist schon auch noch dazu gekommen. Und jetzt die ganze Welt, die sorgen sich um deren inneren Sicherheit. Wenn USA jetzt absieht, was wird mit Afghanistan? Was wird die Ängste der Afghanen? Und die zweite Fehler, als Amerika noch im Krieg in Afghanistan war, dann haben die schon mal in Irak angefangen, den Krieg durchzuführen. Ihr Staat macht einen Fehler nach dem anderen. Was soll dann demnächst mit Afghanistan passiert werden? Danke. I saw a third question here, and then uh, we go back to... Let me... Okay. <laughs> he has right. a Sorry. Is it, huh? Yes, I think... No, no. Is it related? Um, yeah, 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 sure. It's regarding, because uh, from the morning till now, there was lots of comments on Pashtun's uh, representation in Afghan government, because I also, one of the person which I uh, really uh, focus on this issue, um, because I don't want Pakistan to advocate on behalf of Pashtun, but pa Pakistan unfortunately took it as an advantage how to support a, a small group of Taliban and tell them this is an, a, like a you, Pashtun or like a deprived from power. Yes, Karza is a Pashtun, absolutely and he's elected president of Afghanistan, which he was mostly supported by Tajik and by Uzbek or Hazara or other, because they seek more their benefits in his presence in Afghanistan. But it doesn't mean that uh, Pashtun are uh, uh, truly, because Pashtun are the biggest uh, majority, which is absolutely marginalized, but doesn't mean that Pakistan should take it as an advantage and use uh, this an excuse and support uh, uh, Taliban to use against the stability of Afghanistan. I hope they shouldn't take it. And also when he mentioned about our uh, uh, some so-called leaders that they were Pakistan uh, use it against the government of Afghanistan because how to Afghan government should forget about Pashtunistan, then, then, then 
why they are claiming to get Kashmir back and come back to uh, Pakistan. If they let uh, uh, themselves to and uh, excuse themselves how to fight uh, um, or uh, nobody should talk about Pakistan, then they, why they are taking uh, Kashmir as an issue and always uh, create a problem for uh, the security of India as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ejaz, may I remind you that we only have 10 minutes left, so please keep your uh, answers short. Dora, it is uh, not up to me to uh, decide whether President Karzai is a good Pashtun or a bad Pashtun or not a Pashtun at all. I think uh, it is uh, up to uh, the Afghans to decide. I don't understand why. No, but, no, but now you'll have to hear me out. I'm not challenging at all. I mean, you can't intervene. If I have to answer, then, you know, you let me finish. I don't know which Pashtuns he, wants, he was wanting to talk to. Uh, clearly, there's a problem with some Pashtuns. And that problem he has to address. So it's not about his being a good or bad Pashtun. Pakistan has uh, mostly been ruled uh, among the civilians, mostly been ruled by non-Punjabis as presidents and prime ministers. And yet, there's always the Punjabi dominance. Even when the prime ministers have been Sindhis or the presidents have been Pashtuns, as in the case of President Ayub Khan and others. So it's not about we deciding whether he's a good or a bad Pashtun. It's about a ground situation that he has to deal with. And I don't think that he has dealt with that ground situation. And that is entirely up to, uh, you know, you folks to, uh, to deal with it. As far as the, the small number of Taliban are concerned, I don't know. It seems to me that there is a large number of them. I may be completely wrong. Uh, it seems to me when I was in Kabul earlier this year uh, that the, the governor of uh, the, you know, the Maidan Vardak province could not enter into his own province without having some kind of modus vivendi with the Taliban. I mean, the Sadabar district, which is right west of Kabul, is swarming with them. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't have numbers on them. But clearly, there's a problem. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe uh, the entire world is wrong. Even the Americans think that there's a, there's a, a large problem. Uh, as far as, uh, 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 ma'am, your question is concerned, I got only part of it because the translation kind of was, you know, getting mixed up with what you, you were saying. Uh, but if I heard you correctly, you said something about the women rights during the up until the communist regime or something. Uh, is that correct? Is, is that? Sorry? Before that, that, uh, Afga that Afghan women have the rights uh, since 1919. But so I heard you the, right. Yes, you were talking about yes, the, yes. the Afghan women right. The, the right I, mean, is... I, have, I have absolutely no problem. I mean, m my wife teaches. My daughter is doing a DPhil. Okay? So I have no problem. I mean, as a matter of fact, I would like the Afghan women to equally participate. I would just love the fact that an Afghan woman becomes the president of Afghanistan. Ma'am, no, 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 look, we, we are not going to get into, no, we, either we can have a civilized debate or we can get into this kind of accusation across. I, I don't think that it is, it is uh, you know, appropriate because then I can, uh, you know, answer back in ways that will not be very polite. There is a situation, that situation you have to deal with. I am giving you a clear perspective on the fact that no decent person in Pakistan would like to see the Afghan women being subjugated. But here is one little formulation from Pakistan, and I think this, is, this formulation is important. In Kafristan, uh, we have a community which had this obnoxious tradition of sending women out of the house during the menstrual period, okay? Now, the government went in and they decided that there are two ways of going about it. One is that they try to re-engineer their social setup. The other is to provide small houses and hutments to those women when the family sends them out. 
we decided and i agree Just, with that approach we decided that we will go for the latter course I, it I, is up to afghanistan to evolve the system whereby women would yeah. have their rights it is not up to us to decide we need our security we are getting probably a bit too much into into pakistan bashing and ijaz bashing um, let me therefore ask darcy she was I, also I have addressed no problem with that. <laughs> you're the no only pakistani I mean, in the room so <laughs> i have no problem with that because i think when 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 states cannot resolve issues internally they always find an external actor to <laughs> <laughs> so darcy um, the us has also been criticized india has not been criticized so far so after <laughs> udai please <laughs> we had our share <laughs> Um, I mean, to the idea that the U.S. Uh, has certainly made mistakes, absolutely. Um, when the U.S. makes mistakes, we tend to do them uh, relatively large. Uh, and um, I think that we have our share of mistakes that we have made uh, specifically with respect to Afghanistan um, over the last many decades. Um, But that being said, um, I think that I stand by my earlier point that the political will in the U.S. for any kind of continued sustained presence in Afghanistan isn't there, and that figuring out what the best path is um, to, to transition out of a situation in which the U.S. has a significant presence there um, is going to be necessary. Um, yes, we have bases all over the world, um, including surrounding both China and Iran, but as a general rule, people on those bases aren't getting killed on a daily basis, and their costs are rather lower. Um, my, one of my brothers was born here in Germany when my father was stationed here. Uh, my husband uh, spent a tour of duty here um, serving in the U.S. military. We absolutely have bases all over the world. But the 2012 total defense budget for the United States was $707 billion. A little over $120 billion of that went to Afghanistan alone. And the super committee that just failed um, out of the U.S. Congress um, their failure means that there will be $600 billion in automatic cuts to the U.S. military over the next 10 years. Those cuts are going to come from somewhere. And when the American public and the Congress has to figure out what is going to get cut, the odds are very high, given that most Americans have no idea why we're even still in Afghanistan, that the presence in Afghanistan will be one of the things that gets significantly cut. Uday wants to comment yeah, as well. If I could just take a minute or two. First of all, I should provide covering fire for Ajaz. <laughs> Having known him for many years, I want to say this with complete conviction, and this is not a lighter way in comment. As far as women's issues are concerned, Ajaz represents, I would say, a very liberal spectrum in Pakistan, and whatever he said is absolutely true. I don't think there's any doubt on that. But there is a larger issue, and here I want to come back to a point which we raised in Brussels a few months ago when there was a conference between... EU representatives and some from South Asia on a security, you know, what are the challenges? Why should you as a group of largely, I would imagine, German members really look at this issue, whether it's AFPAC or whether it's terrorism or it is the extremism of ideologies? Today is the 23rd of November. Three days from now in my country, in India, we are going to be observing the third anniversary of Mumbai, 26-11. And apart from a large number of Indians, there were Europeans and there were Americans and other nationalities who had died in what was really an extreme attack, you know, which at a lower level was like 9-11. Now, that's the concern for India, and I'm sure for many other people. You do not want a repeat of Madrid. You do not want a repeat of London. You do not want a repeat of Mumbai. And this is, again, a very strongly held view, definitely in India, that if earlier patterns of Afghanistan are allowed to recur with the kind of involvement that Pakistan had at one point in time, it would pose a very serious probability index for us, meaning that the probability of such attacks in random at any other part of the world is a very high incidence. And therefore, we remind, and I want to really bring this to Ajaz's notice also, saying that why this concern all over the world? Now, you have the Mike Mullen view, Admiral Mike Mullen's statement before he retired about his 
perception or even determination about the linkage between the Pakistani, and I use the word very advisedly, establishment, and certain groups in Afghanistan, Haqqani, etc., which are supporting terror. Now, those of you who track the subject might have seen a BBC documentary, which again makes the same point, Madam, that you had said about the duplicity that there are agencies within Pakistan which on one side support the war on terror, but are also providing this so-called, shall we say, encouragement and nourishment to terror. Now, Afghan officials themselves have their own experience of this. So our point is that there is a history where when the Taliban was evolving, there were only three countries in the world that supported the Taliban. It was Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Pakistan. I mean, it was a political choice at that time, but it also had a subtext. And that, and that subtext, to my reading, was Islamic theology and a political manifestation of Islam, where you had Saudi Arabia and its own, shall we say, states leaning towards it on the Sunni side, having one agenda, and then you had Iran and its own support base supporting another agenda. So I only want to make this larger point, I'm an analyst. I'm not scoring debating points. I am saying this region is very troubled for a variety of reasons. It's not just politics. Christian drew attention to the divergent political and foreign policy objectives. But there is a subterranean agenda also. And that in turn, I think, is being leavened or influenced by many other factors. And I think we are all affected including the Americans. I've just said this to a meeting that we had in the Pentagon on the same subject, saying that America may withdraw physically the troops, but the problem will follow you. It's a problem of a certain ideology, which is why I don't know if our Australian colleague is here, Miss Trudy, who showed us that fantastic video. I think what is being contested is the practice of Islam and the interpretation of Islam. I mean, more than a good Pashtun, it is what constitutes a good Muslim. What is the practice? Is it the Taliban version, as is being currently, shall we say, advanced? Or is there a more moderate view that many people in Pakistan share? But that, unfortunately, is not receiving the kind of attention, which is why I believe that we need to look at this in a far more holistic way than making it stovepipes that are only political or only security, which are important. I'm not denying it. This is a serious issue. You, nobody can quit and go. Let me put it that way. Thank Sorry. you very much, Uday. Um, we are shortly um, running out of time. So um, I think our discussion here this evening uh, almost comes as a proof to Christian's introductory thesis that regional cooperation is very unlikely to be the solution. Um, <laughs> let, me, um, let me ask all our panelists uh, in a short uh, concluding round, what would, from your point of view, need to change in order to make um, uh, regional cooperation more likely? Yes, please start from... Well, I would say, uh, as was my final sentence in the presentation, uh, regional cooperation uh, maybe... Just let me have a look. Yes, uh, I think regional cooperation would be good if we would concentrate it on the economic side, but we have a very unhappy or the negative kind of regional cooperation that's on the political side, which are about all the interferences that we have... That that uh, we have talked. So I would also promote, also with some cautious remarks, that regional cooperation is not the solution to the problems, but of course it may help to improve at least some of the um, economic uh, constellations in the, uh, in the region. Thank you. I think it's not something that you can, again, talking about the desirable and the doable, I think step by step certain things are happening. Uh, and certain things are happening between India and Pakistan. And uh, given the fact that even those Afghans, uh, who probably don't like me right now, uh, uh, they also know, and I say this on the basis of my uh, you know, conversations with Afghan friends inside Afghanistan, that Afghanistan and Pakistan have to have an arrangement. This is the tyranny of geography. Uh, and this, this is a tyranny that even the United States as a superpower could not uh, do away. Uh, otherwise, I can assure you that the United States would have made us irrelevant a long time ago. Uh, so the tyranny of geography is there, and therefore, uh, I think it makes eminent sense 
as I said and I'll again emphasize, the two things are important. One, India and Pakistan to uh, continue to move on the path of normalization. And two, Afghanistan to begin to understand its own configuration and understand what exactly would be the doable political expression of that within Afghanistan, in addition to, of course, the economic linkages that it already has with Pakistan. And those economic linkages are very important. Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan is the biggest trading partner of Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, most of the, the market for cement, you know, uh, wheat, uh, dairy, uh, you name it, it's all captured primarily by Pakistan. So, so I think those linkages are there. Sorry? Sorry, which, which one? I mean, I didn't Sorry, name all, the, we I didn't really, name all we, the products. We, we, cannot, we cannot get into this so, discussion. So I think... Uh, at least I hope, although in military strategy, hope is a four-letter word, but I do hope that uh, these three countries in their own bilaterally and also trilaterally can build on the positives uh, which exist and which can be exploited. I think I also believe that regional cooperation is going to be the only way out and it has to be, of course, be preceded by these bilaterals. And the politics, as Christian pointed out at the moment, is not very enabling. But I want to recall to our audience what our Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, said when he became Prime Minister in 2004. And he was pilloried in our country because the terrorism issue is something which is very acute. He repeated it when he became a Prime Minister the second time, that if he has a vision, it is those of you who know the geography, Breakfast in Amritsar, which is India. Lunch in Peshawar, Pakistan. And dinner in Kabul. And in a way, he's talking about, you know, restoring these rhythms. And that's the only way in which the region will become less troubled. But it has to be preceded by a certain amount of, I would say, trust but verify. Which India and Afghanistan are differently saying, and I'm sorry to make this last note seem slightly, you know, shall we say negative, but there needs to be that assurance that the Pakistani military will stop investing in terror as a strategic option. That's all we are asking. That's what Afghanistan is asking. You know. We don't have any time, but I strongly object to this formulation. We can have a bilateral on this. I would suggest that, yes. <laughs> Please, Dar Darcy, well, you don't like the Afghan cuisine? <laughs> um, I, I think that the prevailing view in the United States is that regional cooperation is essential. And I don't think that um, anyone believes that the problem will go away if we leave. The idea that it will follow us is one that we understand. But uh, if some level of stability can't be achieved, it becomes more and more likely that the U.S. response involves drones and bombs rather than um, more peaceful methods of addressing the issues, and that's not good for anyone. Um, and so uh, it, it is certainly in our interest that the region be stable and peaceful. It is in uh, everyone's interest that the region be stable and peaceful. And uh, I suspect that any steps in that direction would be uh, welcomed and encouraged uh, in a broad way by the U.S. The last word on this panel has, has an Afghan, naturally. Please, Thank Sanjay. you. Uh, well, I think <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm going back to the issue of Duran line. Uh, according to the story, the Pakistanis did not uh, show interest in Geneva negotiation on 1990 about Duran Line. They didn't show interest in uh, Duran Line during the time of Taliban. And even they didn't show interest in Bonn Conference. So I think if the Pakistan wants to solve the issue of Duran, they should come clearly to the public with a very honest and clear proposal. And 
And also, they, they have to show a positive sign of, you know, giving something to Afghanistan for asking, you know, Duran line. Uh, the second issue is, is, is the terrorism. Terrorism is, is, is a common enemy of, of the region. It's the common enemy of everyone, the human. Pakistan knows that, that, that they create a monster and this monster turned against themselves. So there should be some steps against uh, Akani network, Mullah Omar. They are freely, you know, working. Uh, I, I'm giving you a very, very, you know, a good example. When uh, Amrullah Saleh was the chief of ANDS, I was with them in, in, in a trip. I was, uh, I was working in, with RTA at that time. Uh, they gave it a map, telephone numbers, and the address of residents of Osama bin Laden in 2007. When the Americans killed Osama bin Laden in 2010, in 2011, in May, the, the place that Osama was killed was just 12 kilometers away from the, the place that the Afghan Indians gave it the map to the Pakistanis. But at that time, Pakistan says these evidence are not up to date. Thank you. I would, uh, yes. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Just, just, I would just like, no, one thing. No, I don't want to get into it details. Just, I don't. I, the, I deliberately said the last, did not. I said the last no, no, word no. on this panel goes no, to no, an that, Afghan. It, and, uh, it's his word. That. All it's, I'm it's, saying is <laughs> that I did not want to get into this because then I have my counterpoint of view regarding what you have said, and also regarding uh, you know uh, uh, Mr. Amrullah Saleh's that famous thing that is now sort of resounding everywhere. We have our own this thing, but I didn't want to get into that. Well, if you want to, then we can do that on the sideline. So um, I think, thank, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. I think we know, know very well why dinner in Kabul is still quite unlikely. <laughs> um, Dinner at HBS uh, is quite close. <laughs> there is some dinner downstairs. Um, and I'd also like to invite all of you to stay on with us uh, at 7 o'clock. We'll have uh, our concluding session here about 10 years after Petersburg. Where does Afghanistan stand today? And we have uh, very interesting guests. We will have uh, Fahim Hakim, who has been speaking before. But there will also be the special representative of the German government, Michael Steiner, for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Pakistan. There will be Fritjof Schmidt, who is a German parliamentarian of the Green Party and the Speaker for Foreign Policy. And there is Fazel Rabi Hakbin, the Program Director of the Asia Foundation in Kabul. And uh, Barbara Unmüssig will be chairing this. So I'd like to invite you, all of you, to stay here. And, 7.15 for time uh, Yes, I think 7.15 um, is realistic. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.